Awesome. Good morning, Journey Church. How's everybody doing? Amen. Amen. Man, such a good time of worship. Thank you, Isaiah. It's going to be a great day of getting into his word. We are getting into the book of Revelation. How many of you guys have been reading this at home already, been digging in a little bit? And going, what in the world is happening? I have no idea what is going on in this book, right? <laughs> uh, and hey, real quick before we get into today's message and we start our teaching, I want to remind you guys, hey, this weekend on uh, Saturday and Sunday, we're going to be out at the Orange Park Fall Festival that meets there at the, uh, I don't even know what that area is called. It's like their... The town hall, right? Their town hall. Um, sorry, I'm new to the Orange Park area still. I don't, I don't ever travel that way. But the, we'll be out there at the town hall and we'll have a booth there. It's going to be awesome. We want to invite you to join us to be a part of that and just love on our community. Uh, you can help take photos, just love and greet people as they're roaming around. It's a great time to just spread the love of Jesus in a season where the enemy has tried to scare people. <laughs> so we can just love on people and just share the good news. But hey, if you want to be a part of that, uh, you can text the word FALL to our phone number at 904-503-6772. That's a hard number to remember. So if you don't remember it, it's on the screens as you walk out. It's on our Facebook. I want to encourage you to sign up to be a part and just maybe pick a couple hours to come out and join us for that. So it's going to be good. I hope to see everyone there. I already know I am. Our number is going to be blowing up right now of everybody signing up. We're not going to have enough positions. I have such faith that you guys are going to be there. I'm encouraged by that. But hey, this morning, uh, like I said, we're, we've been in this book of Revelation. We kicked it off last week, and, and Jim did an amazing job. I'm like, we're here for Jim. That was amazing. And really what I loved about Jim's message, he gave us this incredible insight of this book. And it's really, it's not so much about the events that take place, but it's about this revelation that Jesus is who he says he is. That he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and that he has a plan and that he's coming back. And so it is an exciting book for believers to hold on to. It's an exciting book for us to read and dig into. But we do realize that it can be um, hard to understand at times. And so we want to unpack that a little bit and go through that. And, And even before we do that today, uh, I wanted to even pause from going in e- deeper into the book and really reflect back as to, to set the book up maybe a little bit better, to set the book up uh, to understand why it's significant for this season, why it's significant for us as believers to be reading this word. Um, and really as we're kind of going through it, uh, you know, Revelation says that is, is blessed who hear and take heart because the time is near. And how do we know the time is near? Well, uh, that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about some of this timeline. I want us to understand the significance of reading this book. And, and there's a reason why it's at the end of the Bible, because hopefully you've had some context built up by the time you get to it to understand what's happening. And so I want to fill in some of those gaps today in case you don't have that context. You're like, what? I really don't know what's happening. These, the symbolism, I don't understand what's happening. So we're going to go through that a little bit today. Um, and, and I just want to let it be an encouragement to you, not to be something to be fearful of, not to be something that we get scared of because as believers it is our hope it is it is our strength it is it, it is exciting knowing that Christ says who he says he is and that he's coming back for his church amen amen let's pray real quick Father, we just invite you into this room. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just minister to our hearts today, Father God, that it would be your words today, Father God, that it would be your scripture taught, Father God, that you would reveal to us, God, what you're doing all throughout scripture, Father God, for the hope that we will spend eternity with you, God, that you would be on your throne, Father God, and that we would seat you at the place, God, that you deserve in our own hearts. So God, just open our hearts today to receive from it, Father God. Help us to have open ears and hearts to to have clarity, God, that we don't walk in with just... Um, preconceived ideas of who you are or your thoughts, God, but we're open to understanding what your word is teaching today, God, and we just love you for it, and we thank you in your name. Amen. So truthfully, as I was kind of digging through um, direction for this message, my original approach was um, I wanted to kind of maybe walk through some of the timelines and, and, and really look at where we are in the season or what's to take place. And, and as I started looking at it, I said, wow, there is a lot in Scripture about these end-time prophecies. So really, I found that there's, there's eight times as many end-time prophecies than there were than the first coming of Jesus. So it's, the, the, the Scripture is full of these signs. It's full of these prophecies. 
prophecies of the end time and what's coming. And so when I was going through and looking at all these ideas, I decided I'm going to narrow it down to one focus. I wanted to look at one passage of scripture so we don't get confused with everything else that's going on and, and just to help us gear our attention towards the season that we're in a little bit. And so I wanted to look at Matthew 24, and it, it may be a, a passage of scripture you're familiar with, one that you've read before, um, but really Jesus is laying out some of these signs for us. He's laying out these signs of the end times. And then again, I'm using this to, to set us up for revelation because it's going to help bring clarity to what's happening and why it's happening as we go through these these chapters of revelation and so he's laying out some signs for us so we're going to dig through a little bit of what he's saying and he's helping us see the season and and i appreciate signs because signs are things that are familiar to us it's it's things that we can recognize it helps us to know where we're going how far we've gone you you see the signs as you're driving down the road and it really gives you direction of of where you're at and 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 how i'm getting to where i need to get and and they're really helpful for this guiding principle so these signs are important and jesus really uh, uh sets up these these physical signs but also spiritual signs for us to be looking for so it starts off in Matthew 24, uh, just to kind of set it up a little bit. Jesus is speaking with his disciples, and, and they had just left the temple. And some of his disciples are really kind of uh, admiring the temple. And like, wow, look at how big these stones are. This place is amazing. And Jesus kind of catches them off guard a little bit. He's like, hey, yeah, you know, this, this place won't even be around forever. Like, this, this, this place is going to come to pass. Those stones won't even be there much longer. And then it really, it piqued the disciples' attention a little bit. Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, what do you know that we don't know? I feel us in on these end times fill us in on the seasons to come let us let us be aware of what's happening and so he gives us these signs and so i want to read through its entirety and we're going to break it down a little bit he says see that no one leads you astray starting at verse four for many will come in my name saying that i am the christ and they will lead many astray and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars see that you are not alarmed for this must take place but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are but the beginning of birth pains. Then you will do, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray, and, become, and the lawless will become increased. The love for many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaim, proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus is giving us these signs. As I said, he's laying it out for us. And, and Pastor Eric, a couple weeks ago, went through some of the signs in Timothy and this lawlessness that we'd see arise. But I wanted to break down some even further signs that he gives us here in Matthew to help us understand this season. Um, I love how he compares it to these birth pains. And, and if you've been a mom, you know exactly what he's talking about, right? You know how these, the intensity of these contractions. And, and I, I, I don't understand it. I'm not there with you. But I have a wife who's gone through. And I can say, I don't want to experience that, but I know it's not pleasant. I know it doesn't feel great. Um, but these intensity, the, 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 these sharp pains that we're noticing, and the interesting thing about them is as they grow closer to birth, they become uh, more frequent and, and more intense and, and more powerful and more, and it's just, it's more painful. And Jesus is giving us this example that as we see these signs, they are, they are birth pains. And as they're increasing, it's a symbol to us of the time that we're in. And interesting about birth, and all that. We know that when a woman's in labor that there's about nine months, but, and they give you kind of an estimated date, but it never is quite the day, and it doesn't always quite fall on the day they gave you nine months ago. And so what we're learning here is that Jesus gives us insight to the season, and he teaches us that we can have insight to the season, though we may not know the day or the hour. These birth pains are insights to the season that we're in. So let's break them down a little bit. The first one he gives us, uh, in my opinion, is, is, is the number one that will be, be spiritual deception that takes place. Jesus says in verse 5 that many will come in his name, but they will lead many astray. And so one of the primary signs that I feel like we're going to see and that we are seeing is that there is a, is a shift of deep spiritual deception taking place. We've heard in the news of people coming and claiming to be Messiah and Christ, and we don't really fall for it, and we're like, hey, that's not, that doesn't really affect me much, and maybe it's just an insight of what's happening, and not really many people are following it yet, so I do believe that it may get worse. 
but there's also a deception that's taking place just on the, on the spiritual sense that we may be unaware of, that we are being uh, de- uh, deceived, we are being delusionalized to what's happening, and we not, are, are not as so much aware as to what's taking place, that this, in my opinion, would fall into that same category of those that are being led astray by this delusion. Paul teaches, and he's writing in Timothy, he says, uh, don't be deceived. He says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. In my opinion, we're seeing more of this take place. We're seeing more of this, this falling away of the church. And we saw a lot of that with all the COVID. This, this great falling away of, of really a third of the church. Some places, two-thirds of the church just kind of, you know, gave up on their walk with faith. This, this, this intensity and this time, they became deceived. And so there's this evidence of a spiritual deception taking place currently and already. And in my generation, uh, you know, I'm hearing a lot, and I don't know if you've heard this in, in your time, but it, it's become so frequent in my, in my circles that I'm hearing of this concept of, of, of spiritual uh, or deconstructing my faith. Like, it's this term that I'm hearing even more mainstream of, oh, I'm just deconstructing my faith. I'm, I'm breaking down my faith a little bit. And really what it is, is people that were claiming to be believers who are now breaking down their faith and explaining why they're not. And it's become so prevalent that it's all over YouTube, it's all over the uh, the, the channels that our youth are watching and they're talking about this deconstruction of faith. And in my opinion, this is that spiritual deception. This is that, that, that leading astray, that they've been led astray to where it's become the mainstream thing to deconstruct your faith in such a way that it's leading others away from Christ. And you might say, you know, hey, as a society, we, we may have just become wiser. We may have just become phys- uh, a, a more engaged uh, on a physiological level that we've become more connected than ever. And what I would argue is that really it's, it's, it's more of on a spiritual level, that there is more deception taking place, that the enemy is at work even harder in this time and in these generations to deceive them and lead them away from the church and lead them away from this relationship with Christ. Because what I believe is that the enemy is trying to, to counter what the Lord wants to do in the end times. As we read in that last part, and we'll get to this, it says at the end that, the, that many will come to know Christ, that the nation, that, that his word will be proclaimed into all the nations. And so there will be a rise of the church at the same time as there is a great falling away of the church, if you can kind of grasp that. That the Lord is going to do something so significant in a season of darkness to bring a season of light as well. Jesus continues that there will be wars and rumors of wars. And you begin to see these wars escalate and pop up all over the world and, and the constant rumors of new wars and battles. And, and again, just as these contractions that we spoke of are increasing and getting, and getting, and getting more painful, it, it's signs of where we're at. And you can look in our world today and say, hey, you know what? These rumors and these wars, they are increasing. We're noticing them more and more. And we're seeing it every time we turn on the news. In the 1700s to the 1800s, you know, I looked it up, I did some research on it. It says there were only about 100 plus wars that took place in that 100 year century span. In the 20th century, the century we just completed from the 1900s to the 2000s, it says there were upwards of 15,000 wars that had taken place. And there's evidence that, and it feels like, hey, you know, maybe it's not a massive escalation in the day we're in, but over the course of history, we're seeing just this rise of violence, this rise of hatred, this, this rise of fighting amongst one another. Verse 7, he continues, he says that there would be nation that would rise up against nation. And it's easy to kind of kind of clump this all together and say, oh, just mean wars and we're going to rise. But really what I think he's saying is that, yes, nation will fight against nation and there will be the rise of that conflict. But the Greek word that was used here was ethnos and it's where we get our word ethnicity from. There's to be this rise and what I feel like he's teaching us, a rise in even ethnically charged battles amongst one another. Not so much just to conquer land, but ethnicities fighting against one another, nation against nation. I, I, I've seen this in my own lifetime with, with, with all over the Middle East. You can see the Kurds are having issues where there have been 100 years without a homeland and they, they are kind of in all these different countries fighting uh, with ethnicities and sharing land with them. Um, I had a friend, I remember in middle school, that was a, a, um, a refugee from Yugoslavia and he was a refugee from that point because there was a division amongst the ethnicities that lived there. Even here in the Western world, in America, we're seeing this, this tension begin to rise from even the 
400 plus years of slavery and the 250 years that was here in the United States and going all the way back to the Jim Crow laws and, and, and uh, the civil rights in the 60s. And even today, we're still seeing residue of that social injustice and that, that racial injustice that took place. And it's, it's coming to tension. It's coming to tension. In the, and Jesus prophesies that in the end days, you're going to see an intensity of this, an intensification of these ethnically charged battles coming to surface. There's signs of the end times. There's signs of the season that we're in. He says, kingdom will come against kingdom. And the word kingdom here means a territory or a, a dominion. It, it's, it's a literally sense of like a borders. It, it's this fight against borders, this fight against land in, the, in these areas and, and, and those trying to take over other areas of land. But as I was reading more into it, there's even, um, um, if you're looking at the Greek words, there's inside that it could even be meaning the, the kingdom in the sense of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness battling against one another. That there would be this, this increased battle, this increased intensification of the kingdom of God advancing throughout the church against the kingdom of darkness and this, this struggle that takes place. It goes on to talk about famines and earthquakes in various places. And really, in Luke, he adds the word pestilences. And, and if you're aware of the Gospels, they, they share a lot of the similar encounters with Jesus. And the synoptic Gospels, they, they all speak in similar language and share their experience with Jesus. So you can look in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and they all kind of share this, this, uh, this one time where Jesus is teaching this. And Luke uses the word pestilence there, so I'm going to speak of that as well. Um, but these famines, these earthquakes, and these pestilences are really shifting gears from how we are behaving it's shifting gears from how the populace is behaving and, and really how we see in the end times this, this increase of violence rising up and really this, this Cain-like spirit to fight one another, to, to be on attack of one another and this, 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 this manifestation of violence in our own bodies and our own hearts. And he's shifting it to now saying this, this manifestation of violence will also be seen in creation. This violence will be seen in, the, in, in, in nature itself and through the, the, the famine and the earthquakes and the pestilences that are to come. And he says the things like famine, right? We, we, we're aware of famine. And it's, it's amazing to me how Africa is maybe one of the most richest soils, the most uh, uh, fertile soils, but yet it cannot feed all of its people. There's a famine there. And then there, there's things like the earthquakes. As the earthquakes begin to intensify, you hear them all the time now. It's like you can't even turn on the news about hearing a new earthquake. And, and I was reading and, and realized that they said from earlier parts in history, there's been a tenfold increase in earthquakes in today's time, that the, the earth is literally groaning. The earth is really crying out and rumbling of the season that we're in. As we begin to recognize all these things that are taking place, it's just evidence of the season that we're in. The word pestilence is literally transcribed as disease or epidemics. We're pretty familiar with that word nowadays, ain't we? With COVID and everything that went take, took place. And, and just even in my lifetime, seeing things from SARS to H1N1 to Ebola, these things that become mainstream things that we hear about, the swine flu, these epidemics that continue to arise to the extent where with the COVID that we, we saw the whole world, even with all of modern science, shut down over a pestilence. There's an intensity taking place on a global scale. And Jesus says, and even the King James Version, he says, these are, these are the birth pains. These are the beginning of sorrows. These contractions are growing more intense and closer together. He continues on, he says, they will be delivered, you will be delivered up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray because lawlessness will be increased and the love of many will grow cold. Another sign that Jesus is giving us here is that there will be a mass persecution of followers of Jesus. There will be a persecution of those in faith that are lovers of God. And I want you to think about this today because persecution, we don't really, it's, we're shielded from it in a sense in America, but persecution right now is at its worst it's ever been in human history. That persecution for those in faith are at its all-time high. There's an organization called the Voice of Martyrs that says there are about 215 million Christians who deal with persecution on a daily basis of their faith. And when Jesus spoke these words, these disciples, they go on to the book of Acts and they start to experience persecution. But really it was only happening on a level of 100 to, to thousands at a time of persecution. But today we're seeing that times on a million scale. We're seeing 200 so million Christians walk in this persecution, dealing with persecution, that are losing their lives over their faith. 
In 2019, more people died because of their faith as believers than the last 10 years combined. There was an increase in persecution of those who are followers of Jesus, this intensity. There will be lawlessness increased. The word lawless can mean many different things. Uh, the, the first one meaning immorality, meaning that the moral standards, that there will be a decrease, and Pastor Eric did a great job preaching on this a couple weeks ago, this decrease of moral standards, this decrease uh, of, of, uh, of morality in our own society. And we see this. You see the stuff that is getting passed, and we're seeing this now maybe for the first time in America, this, this release of, of morality and this lawlessness that's beginning to rise and wanting to live by our own standard and, and choosing what is right and what is wrong, and there's no longer this, this moral compass of how we're to live by. It's becoming more intense. It's becoming more evidence. Another term for lawlessness could be anarchy, that these systems that were in place that are meant to, to hold our sinful nature at bay begin to diminish, that we begin to revolt against the government more, that we begin to revolt against what's happening, and this anarchy rises up and causes chaos. It says that the love of many will grow cold. And to me, this is really one of the most alarming ones, that the love of many will grow cold. Really, I believe in our natural tendency as humans, believers or non-believers, there's this this tendency to to truly love one another, to to care for one another, to help one another. And, and, And society tries to use that to their advantage. But I believe that it's going to be an increase, and he's teaching us that there will be an increase of where that starts to go away. And you're already seeing it, this rise in violence, this rise of hatred towards one another, this rise in battling of one another, that we're trying to be, it's my world, it's how I want to live it, I don't care what's going on to my left or to my right, as long as I'm happy, as long as I'm taken care for, I don't really mind, right? It's, It's this love for me versus love for others. But in the end times, it will begin to grow colder. The love for others will begin to grow cold. And Jesus, he gives us this one final sign that I feel like we need to pay attention to. Um, and it's, it's a positive sign. It's a great sign. It's, it's that in the midst of all this violence, in the midst of all this chaos, he says that the church will continue to push forward, that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. It's not, and it, it, you see, that in the end days, it's not just going to be the devil at work. It's not just going to be the demons that are active. And yes, they will be. Really, human nature is going to reach its climax of sin. It's going to reach the, the highest point of sinful nature that we can achieve as humans. And that, and that will bring on, really, the, the judgment of God. That will bring on the end times to really judge the world of its sin and its lawlessness and, and how it's been handling itself and how it's been living. But he also gives us an incredible promise here of how the church is going to be in that same season. At the same time, the church is going to be powerfully anointed to spread the gospel, to continue to spread the word. And that's going to come with the technology. That's going to come with our ability to literally live stream at any point. Someone around the nation can get online and hear the gospel. That's never been able to happen within just the last 10, 20 years of, 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 of really of, of, of all time that the, we have that ability with technology to spread the gospel at the speed of light. It's incredible. But really what I also think it's saying is the church will become empowered and anointed with a boldness to spread the gospel, that we will be more prepared to spread the gospel, that we will recognize the season that we're in and that we will be bonded together in unity and that we will see our call as believers and say, hey, it's time to stop messing around. We got work to do. We need to tilt our eyes towards heaven and begin to walk and see revival. We need to walk and see his kingdom advanced. We're not going to be paralyzed. I hear so many speak of the end times and go, oh, man, what a tough season it's going to be. It's going to be so hard. We're going to face persecution and death. But really the church, he's saying, is going to, it won't even be phased by it. It will continue. Yes, there will be a great falling away, but those that keep hold to it will be saved, and they will see a boldness rising and to stand in the face of fear, to stand in opposition of what culture tells us to be afraid of and walk and proclaim the gospel with boldness. We will really take heed what Jesus says in Luke 21, verse 28. He says, now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Listen, straighten up, raise your heads, because redemption is drawing near. We don't have to be slouched down and, and de- depressed and, and hanging on to the baggage of the world and, and doom and gloom and what happened to my 401k, right? But we can straighten up. 
and we can tilt our heads to heaven and say, Lord, my redemption is drawing near and I have a plan and a purpose and I'm going to live it out here on earth. And the church is going to be unified by that. The church is going to grow because of that. The, the gospel will be spread to all people groups. There's almost 5,000 people groups that have not been reached yet with the gospel that missionaries haven't gotten here. But the word says that they will be reached, that the church will go into those areas with a boldness and a faith to see the kingdom of God advance in those seasons. As I mentioned at the start, this, these signs, this list is not exhaustive. There's, there's so many more scripture and there's so many more prophecy that really line up how to tell with the season that we're in and the end times we're in. You can go look in, in Daniel and read all the prophecy that he puts there. Revelation gives a lot that we're going to go through as well. Uh, there's so much on, on the nation of Israel that we're already seeing that we really don't have time to get into. But these are all signs that we are in a season. I don't know if it will be my generation. I don't know if it will be 100 years from now. But what we can tell is that these birth pains have increased. That these, the, the, the contractions continue to come. That Jesus is preparing his time. He's preparing the church for the season to come. That he's preparing for these end times. And, and so how as a church, and I want to spend the next part of this message, how as a church should we respond how should we live? And what questions are we asking ourselves knowing, hey, if it's my generation that the Lord returns, what do I want him to find? How do I want him to find me? How do I want him to see me as? How do I want him to, 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 to know I'm living out this faith and I'm walking in it? And those questions, I would say that there, it's not going to come accidental. That you're not going to be led astray, that you're not going to be deceived just because, you know, you, you, you made one, a one-time prayer. But it's going to be a disciplined lifestyle. A lifestyle of living after him, a faithful lifestyle of recognizing that you are the bridegroom of Christ and that you have been called on a mission to live out. And I want to walk through that a little bit of what that means for us as we dive digger into this. Mark 13, 22, Mark 13, 32 to 37, Jesus gives us really a simple insight. He says, but concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It will be like a man going on a journey when he leaves his home and puts his servants in charge. Each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows in the morning. Yes, he comes suddenly and finds you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Everybody say, stay awake. He says it four times over and over, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. Don't get distracted is what he's saying. He's realize the time that you're in, realize you're seeing these signs come to pass. Stay awake, recognize what's happening. You hear so much in culture about woke this, woke that church. Stay awake, right? Stay awake in this season. We should be the woke ones. We should be the ones alert and focusing on what he is doing in this season. So how should we live? I want to give you a few things. I think we should live with a sense of urgency. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know the season. The birth pains have increased. They're intensifying. It's hard to look at it and say, like, hey, listen, every one of those prophecies have been fulfilled already. We've seen it all. But now it's, it, it's getting more intense. It's becoming more rapid. We should recognize the season we're in and say, we've got work to do. We have kingdom work to do. It's not the time. Pastor Eric has been teaching on this. This ain't the time to be on the, on the, the cruise ship. This is the battleship season. This is the time where we focus on, on spiritual warfare and have our mentality focused on battlefield. That we are to stay awake and we are to stay urgent to what is this season is. The King James Version, when he says stay awake, really breaks it down and, and, and describes it as to take heed, to watch, and to pray. Take heed. What does that mean? It means that we should self-examine ourselves, that we should take recognition, and we should call attention to ourselves and take heed of what we are doing. We should take the, the pulse check of who we are. Are we encountering God on a daily basis? Are we, are we experiencing him on a daily basis? Are, is our heart right with him? This should be a daily act of, of our worship with him is, Lord, search my heart. Is there anything that I've sinned against you, that I've done against you? Is there, is there anything that I'm holding? Is there, un, is there free unforgiveness that I'm holding on to, bitterness or anger? Take heed of yourself. Examine where you are in the faith. You know, we always step onto scales and to weigh ourselves. And we get on the scale and it tells us, you know, you know based off our weight, I probably should lose a few pounds. Right, or maybe, maybe I'm healthy, or maybe I, I could probably gain a couple. And we get on the scale, and it's a good indicator of where we're at. And some of us this morning need to get on that spiritual scale and say, Lord, where is my faith? 
Where is my faith with you? How have I been living, taking heed and examining myself and my walk with you? Because we don't get cold all at once. It's, it's in degrees. Your temperature, you don't take it out of the microwave and it goes instantly cold. If you leave it and you don't touch it, you don't, you don't, you don't enjoy it, you don't operate it, it, it slowly cools down. It becomes lukewarm and cold. And if you don't recognize it, if you're not daily taking heed of that, you can find yourself cold in the faith. You can find yourself callous. You can find yourself as a one that, that Jesus describes that doesn't love others, that you've grown cold. You've become callous to what's happening around us. We should watch. The Bible uses this word watch as really a military term. And it's almost though we've been set as soldiers on a post and we've been given the responsibility to watch what the enemy is doing, to recognize the, the activity, to recognize the spiritual attacks, to recognize the, the, the things that are coming against us. That it's, it's not just sit out on the post and enjoy the breeze, enjoy the sunshine of this beautiful pasture in front of us, but we have been given a strategic call to watch. Be aware of what is happening. Be aware of the season we're in. Be aware of what the enemy is trying to do and deceive the people of God. We are to have a kingdom perspective, a warfare viewpoints, that we are engaging in a spiritual battle. We're to pray. Prayer has got to ramp up. In the end times, prayer has to ramp up. It has to become really, I mean, some of us, we can go weeks without praying to the Lord outside of praying for our meals or, you know, a blessing here and there or when a hard time comes up. But it should be daily that we are seeking after him daily that we are proclaiming his goodness, daily that we are in relationship and communication with him. And I've said this before, but man, one of my biggest frustrations is how the enemy has, has put this fear around the idea of prayer. That if I were to ask everyone right now to stand up and find someone to go pray for, everyone would be like, oh, heck no, like, I ain't, that ain't for me, right? I ain't going to pray for nobody. <laughs> like we get nervous, we get nervous to pray out loud with one another. Isn't that interesting? It's interesting that how we're fearful to prayer, but really the prayer is what carries us. The communication with God, the relationship with God is what's going to grow us. Get into a small group, pick up the Pray First booklets that we have, learn how to pray if you don't feel adequate of how to pray. It doesn't have to be hard, but gain confidence in this area because you're gonna need it. In these seasons, you're gonna need to know how to pray. You're gonna need to know how to talk to the Lord. Surround yourself with people that know how to pray. Pray, read, study, grow. Have someone teach it to you. Have, find someone to model it to you if you're intimidated by it. But break off this fear of prayer and begin to walk in it daily with him. Begin to pray for others daily. Begin to intercede for our nation daily and for what the Lord is doing. A couple more things. Gather. that if we're gonna be people that endure to the end, we need to be able to gather under his name, that we need each other, that the church needs each other, that we can't be isolated, that we can't be set apart, that we can't just have our own relationship with the Lord and forget about, the Lord really clears it, walks, tells us to walk in faith with believers, to be amongst each other. So it says in Hebrews, really to, to not forsake the gathering of the assembly of the church, to not forsake the gathering, the assembly of others, it even says in the last days, you should more so gather. Isn't it funny that as we find ourselves in potentially the last season, that there's been attack against the church to gather less. But we are to gather more, that iron sharpens iron, that we need each other, that we're meant to build each other up, that we'd walk in this corporate anointing, even that the book of Acts saw, that as they gathered together, that there was anointing among them to share the gospel, to spread and see others come to know him. And lastly, we should focus on our hope. Because Jesus, he is, he is our blessed hope. Titus says it like this, the glorious returning or the, uh, the glorious returning of Jesus, he, he, he is that blessed hope, that he is our hope that we can hold on to, that in the midst of everything going on, and the persecution, the war of wars, the fighting, the battling, that we have a hope through it all, that we have something that we can hold on to, that we don't need to get distracted, but we have a lifter of our heads and we can woke up and focus on him and know that no matter what's going on around us, that we're gonna be okay. They say that if you're on a boat and you start getting motion sickness, 
that you're to find the horizon and really focus on that horizon because it's, it's the one thing that, that stays and remains. It doesn't move, it doesn't shake with the, the circumstances. And it helps you adjust to all that motion. And as believers, when we focus our attention on the horizon of hope, when we focus our attention on Christ and who he is, it doesn't matter what's going on around us. It doesn't matter what the world's throwing at us. It doesn't matter about the persecution or the attacks of the enemy, but that we have a hope. And I just want to end with this, as we focus on this hope, as we live who we're called to live, that we can't forget the call of our lives in this season, that we can't forget what role we play in it. We need to be grounded. We need to be right with the Lord. We need to to be growing with him. But the church, he says, will proclaim the gospel to all nations, that we will go forth in the midst of all this. Listen, this shift that Journey went through, and, and I hope you recognized it. We did a whole series on it. We continue with all this spiritual warfare. We, I hope you recognize the shift that took place to focusing on the things of God, to focusing on and being able to identify what's happening, to be able to be spiritual war, warriors of what's taking place, because it's not just something that just happened at Journey. This is the Lord moving in this time. I, 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 I'm privileged to know many, many pastors across the nation, and I've been sharing what the Lord's doing here. And they're like, hey, you know what? That's happening here too. We're seeing the same thing. It's incredible what God is doing. There is an outpouring of the spirit that is happening. There is a movement happening. There is a revival taking place within the church to see the kingdom advanced. And Joel it talks about uh, that in the end days, I will pour out my spirit amongst all believers, right? And, and really, we've seen that happen in the book of Acts. But I believe that there's coming, a, we're actually living in it, this, this outpouring in the latter season. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the, the, the farmer, he waits on the harvest. He waits on the harvest and he waits for the early rains and the later rains and the latter rains. And I believe the, the early rains were the Pentecost and the latter rains are now. And that we're living in these latter rains and that we're seeing a harvest come for the church to see the nations come to know him, to be able to proclaim his name to all nations, so that there will be a falling away, but there will be a great rising up of the church in this season. That we don't need to be, we don't need to be hushed, we don't need to be quiet, we don't need to, to feel overwhelmed, but that he has empowered us for such a time as this. Revival is breaking out all over the world. Iran is experiencing revival like they've never seen. I saw a, a, a pastor, a missionary explain, he said, what used to take eight years to convert a Muslim to Christianity, they're seeing in weeks. They're seeing the Lord move on such an incredible scale, such a faith being, being, dis, being distributed to others, that the Spirit of God is moving. And church, we're in that season. We are sheltered from it in a sense because of America, and maybe we're holding on to some past values and some things. But I believe there's a day where we're going to experience it even more so. You're hearing it in the news. You're you're kind of seeing the writing on the wall that there's coming a season where we too are going to experience some more of those hardships. And it should drive us even more to proclaim the gospel. It should drive us even more to share his good news. Would you bow your heads? as the prayer team begins to come forward. Some of you here uh, maybe don't have a relationship with the Lord. Or maybe it's not where you want it to be and, and you don't really feel that you're really walking in how you should walk or, or the relationship that you have is the relationship you need. I wanna remind you that we're being shown the signs. That it's being pretty clear that, hey, these things are happening and not only are they happening, but they're intensifying. We need to straighten up. We need to look forward. We need to lift our head to heaven and focus on our blessed hope in this season. And I want to give you the opportunity this morning, if you don't know the Lord, to not be caught off guard. To not be caught off guard when that day comes. When the day that the Lord returns, it says that he'll come like a thief in the night. And many will be kind of surprised. But what Paul really is teaching to the believers is you really won't be surprised. You may not know the time, but it won't be a surprise to you. It's going to be a surprise to the unbelievers. And so this morning, I don't want you to be surprised. I want you to recognize this blessed hope. I want you to live in this relationship with Christ because we have a hope in this season. We have something to look forward to. If that's you this morning and you need prayer, you want to ask the Lord into your heart, or maybe you need to to straighten up a little bit and refocus your attention on him, 
We have altar team members up here that wanna pray with you, that wanna lead you in that time of prayer, into that relationship with him, that wanna help you confess some things, that wanna help you get some things off your chest and really lay it down at the altar and say, I need to straighten up. I need to look up. I've been too distracted with the things of this world where I've taken my attention off the horizon. I've taken my attention, I've, I've become so distracted with the things of Facebook and, and, and the news cycles, and, and, and I'm not really putting my time and my attention towards the Lord. I'm not really walking in the calling I've been asked to walk in. So I want to pray a prayer of you, and then we're going to open up these altars for a time for you to receive, for you to, to speak with these leaders. But Father, we just lift up each individual in this room. God, I pray right now that you're speaking to the hearts of many. God, that there is just a tension in some people's hearts right now. God, an uncomfortable nature, Father God, where you're, you're trying to speak, Father God. And I pray that they sense that. So I pray that they sense what it is that you're calling them to, Father God, to step out, to walk in boldness, to walk in relationship with you. God, I pray for those that don't know you, God, that they will make the decision today to know you. They would walk in relationship with you, God, that they would recognize that what you did on the cross was enough that what you did on the cross paid for our debt, that, that saves us from this destruction and this judgment, Father God, that you are coming to do to this world. God, but that we have a hope in you, that we have a blessed hope in you, Father. So I pray that we walk in that relationship today. God, I pray that we walk in that seriousness today, God, that we recognize our call to see revival take place in our nation, in our city, for the city of Jacksonville to literally be transformed by the power of God for the glory of God in our generation. God, we believe that the time is now or the season is now. So, Father God, would you pour out your spirit on this church, Father God? Would you continue to release an anointing over this church to proclaim your gospel, to not be so self-centered, to be so focused on just feeling you for ourselves, Father God, but to let our encounters lead to giving away those encounters, to allow others to see and sense who you are in our lives. Father, we submit it all to you today, God. Would you put a boldness in the hearts of people right now, Father God, to come forward? If that's you, I want you just to stand. I want you to come to this altar and to find someone to pray with you. Maybe you just need that encouragement. Maybe you need to give your heart to the Lord for the first time. Maybe this, these end time seasons bring some fear to you and it really shouldn't bring fear, it should bring encouragement because you have a hope. If that's you, you can stand. You can come to these altars. You can find prayer. They wanna pray with you. And as they're praying, I'm going to pray out, and this room will be dismissed, and we can go on. But this team's going to remain up here to continue to minister to those that want to be prayed for. So, Father, we ask that you just seal what you're doing today. Seal what you're doing in the hearts of your believers. Seal what you're doing, God, in, in, in this church. God, empower us to go forward, Lord, that we would walk in a boldness. We love you for the, the grace that you've given us, God, that your mercy you've extended towards us, Father. God, help us to not be good, help us to be good stewards of it, God, that we do not just throw it off, that we not be careless, that we, that we walk in that boldness and that faith. God, may we make a difference in the world we live in. God, we make a difference in the lives around us. God, as we look forward to revelation, that we not be a fear, Father God, but we find encouragement, that we find excitement of what's to come. Help us to recognize this season, this time, Father God. Help us to hold true to these signs that you've given us, God, and be stewards of it. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, you guys are dismissed. Thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. As I said, the altar team is going to remain up here. So if you want some time of prayer with them, do that now. Walk in boldness. Don't let the enemy scare you and tell you to leave without getting prayed for this morning. Amen.